I decided to start a podcast yesterday, and uh, here we are, <laughs> How to Convert a Van, episode one, with four steps of buying a van. So I want to break it down as simple as possible, because buying a van is a tough process that we all have to go through at some point. So I wanted to structure it, as well as I asked you guys on Instagram if you had any questions regarding buying a van. And also, we're going to talk briefly about my story, how I bought my van, because it's actually a little bit of an absurd story with a seller. So let's get right into how to buy a van. So it's important to know what you're looking for, obviously, before you buy a van. And it also depends, buying a van depends on a lot of factors. Some of them you can't even influence. So for example, your region, even within a country, will determine what selection you have. I watched a lot of American van life videos, and they would talk about cars that didn't even exist in Germany where I'm based. And even within Germany, depending on if you're in the West or East, there's already differences in what you can buy. So just keep that in mind that what you see online might not be the best recommendations for your region. So I broke it down into four categories, basically, or four steps. And the first one of that is the budget, because this is already going to filter down what you're going to find on the platforms where you buy a van online a lot. If you have 8,000 euros, there's going to be different results compared to 20K. Now, the budget is obviously something very individual, so I can't say you need this amount of money. I'm a strong believer that you can do van life with pretty much any budget. Now, there's channels like, I think one is called Passport Diaries that I used to watch. This guy buys like vans for 1,000 euros and like fixes them up a bit and makes them nice. And he gets away with like a couple of thousand euros for a full van. I talked to a bunch of people because I was also very unsure and I was saving up. I saved up for like two years and I would always check if I had like 4K in my bank account for the van. I would be like, oh, what, what can I get right now? And what's on the market? So my original budget was around 8K for the van but I ended up uh, spending a lot more because to me it was some, somewhat of an investment. So I wanted to be able to sell it afterwards. So I decided to go with something more expensive in the beginning. But then I think, obviously, I don't know yet, but I believe it'll be easier to sell when I'm done with my van life experience. But if you literally just want to get on the road as quick as possible with as little money as possible, you don't even know if you like it yet, you want to experiment, you can totally do this for... 5,000 euros for a van or less or more. So my tattoo artist actually used to live in a van and he spent 13.5 on the van and 3k for the conversion. And that kind of gave me a reference of what I wanted to do because I liked what he was doing and I wanted a similar van. But I ended up spending about the same on the van but already, and I'm not very far with my build, spending at least 3k for the interior. And I'm not even at a point where there's anything in the van yet. So you have to keep in mind that the budget will also depend on what your comfort will be in the van. If you don't need a fridge, you don't need a lot of electricity, you don't need a lot of cooking, whatever, then you're going to get away with a lot less, obviously, than if you're doing it like me, where you're like buying expensive batteries, and trying to do like a full out van build in the highest quality possible. To sum it up, you can do this for 5k total, for probably 3k total if you get a small camper that's like used, or you can do it for 20k, but the budget should not be what's stopping you from doing it. Alright, so the next thing you're gonna have to think about is the use case, because for me, I'm doing this, or I'm planning on doing this full time for at least a year. And that already sets you up for a lot more challenges than if you're just doing this for, I don't know, on the weekends, for example. I needed a high roof because I wanted to be able to stand in my home. I needed enough space so I can put in a shower cabin, a bed, and a cooking situation, as well as I really wanted a standing desk super bad. So that's already going to take up a lot more space than if you're just, say, needing a bed and, like, some cooking situation. So the use case will determine the size of the car, but also how much you want to spend in the end. All right, let's say you know your budget and you know your use case. When you filter on a website, there's still going to be the option of buying a old timer or a new used car. 
Obviously, you can also buy a new car, but that's going to set you back at least like 40k. So I'm not going to talk about that, but that's going to be the best option if you have the option. Now, in the beginning, I was strongly considering getting an old timer. I love the old Mercedes work vans. I can't really talk about the VW old vans or anything else. I never researched that a lot. And I think a lot of old timers, you just have to be very careful because there's not going to be a lot of parts available and they're going to break down very easily. But for the Mercedes work vans, that's what I researched a lot. And I can tell you, especially in Germany, they're available very easily. There's also a bunch of like old fire trucks that have like 30,000 kilometers on them for like, I don't know, 5,000, 8,000 euros, which are beautiful. And I think a great option. Now, what's good about these is they're pretty easy to fix. Apparently, I have zero knowledge about fixing cars, but there's obviously less electronics in them because they're from the 80s and like old. And you can go to pretty much any workshop to get it fixed. Now, on newer cars, and I believe for the Mercedes Sprinter, this goes starting from 2007 models. Um, you have to go to Mercedes dealers. So I have a 2014 Sprinter which means I'm pretty much, for most bigger things, I have to go to a Mercedes repair shop, which is a bit annoying because it's way more expensive. You can only go to certain repair shops and you're not gonna be fixing anything by yourself. On the other hand, you do have a newer car. And to me, it was very nice to know that my car is not most likely not gonna break down immediately and has less of a chance of breaking down because I just wanted to get on the road. I didn't want to have to worry about my engine breaking or things breaking. So that's why I chose the newest possible car. But like I said, if you're down to like deal with some repairs and have the patience to do that, I think classic old cars are great. Now it's also worth a consideration, especially here in Germany. I don't know how it is in other countries. We have a thing where diesel cars are not allowed on certain streets with the exemption of old timers if they're older than 20 years and newer diesels that don't pollute as much. So this doesn't really make sense, but if you get an old timer, you will be able to drive anywhere in Germany. And if you get a old new car so let's say a 2000 diesel engine it's most likely not going to be able to drive on certain streets which is kind of annoying also taxes i believe insurance too have different prices on old timers and are apparently cheaper which also doesn't make as much sense to me but apparently that's the case so you might be better off with an old timer and like i said i was considering an old timer strongly so i think especially if your budget is on the lower side I personally would probably go with a fire truck. I love those things, looking at them. I was nearly buying one because they have low mileage. They were probably maintained very well by the firemen who know stuff about engines and whatever, and they're beautiful cars. Or like I said, the Mercedes Dudo, I think they're called D508s, and there's like different numbers. Great vans, I love how they look. Also a great consideration, especially if you have a lower budget. Now for newer used cars, there's actually not that much selection. Pretty much the standard is everybody gets a Fiat Ducato slash like they're made by a bunch of other brands, but it's the same car. And that car is great. A lot of like professionally built companies use that as a base. I actually looked at one and it's huge. Like the, you can sleep in it sideways. It's almost two meters wide, great car. A lot of people use it and it's pretty cheap. Like you can find them for relatively good prices. Now, on the other hand, you have the Mercedes Sprinter slash VW Crafter. That's also the same car. And those cars are more expensive from what I found. But apparently, and this is why I bought them, because I wanted the most reliable car, they're more reliable. Now, reliability is kind of like a vague thing, especially if you're buying used, because if the owner before you just smashed that thing to the ground, it was used by like DHL, then that thing's not going to go very far, even if it's a Mercedes Sprinter. But if you have a well-maintained Ducato and a well-maintained Sprinter, apparently the Sprinter will last you longer. Also, what's noteworthy on the Sprinter, apparently it's a bit more efficient, so you save some fuel cost and it's smaller. So the same L2, H2 dimensions, that means length to height to, actually convert to a smaller van. So you don't have the like two meters wide lay in it sideways bed situation in a Sprinter that you have in a Ducato which technically is a drawback. But then again, as I'm only 18 and literally just got my license like a month ago, 
I feel like a smaller car isn't necessarily a bad thing, especially when we're talking about like huge trucks. Like to me, that's a very big car looking at it right now. <laughs> also side note, for sprinters and crafters, it's a bit harder to find matching parts to build your van because for some reason everybody <laughs> uses the Ducato. So for example, when I had to buy my roof rack, it was a bit harder to find the sprinter version than the Ducato which means in the end, if you have less selection, it might be a bit more expensive again. So keep that in mind. If you're trying to do this completely low budget, you should probably stay away from the VW Crafter or Sprinters. Last but definitely not least, actually this might be the most important part. This, will, this was what determined whether or not I buy a van is the seller. The seller is so important to me. I didn't find anyone online who like talked about the seller a lot, but I think the seller should definitely be a give or take for buying a van. I actually contacted a bunch of people before I bought the van I have now, and I solely based on the seller did not buy the van. What do I mean by seller? So first of all, who is selling the car? Is it a private person or like a company that sells vans for a profit? I personally did not like the fact that it was a big company selling the car because then I knew that they bought it from somebody cheaper and are reselling it for a profit, which means you're not getting a good deal. Like it's just, there's no way. That's why to me, every car dealership was pretty much out of the picture unless it was like actually a good deal. But then I still had like trust issues because these car dealerships know stuff about cars. So they probably have the ability to make a car look a lot better than it actually is by like cleaning it and getting things ready just to look nice. So if you ask me, I stay away from car dealerships, but I'm also not very experienced in buying a car. Maybe they're a lot better than I think. The next red flag for me was when the seller was very bad at, to me, English or German, whatever you understand. Here in Germany, we often have people from East Europe come to Germany to like work in construction, which means a lot of vans that were in construction are sold by people that speak, for example, Polish. And it's very hard to communicate with them in German, which to me was a no-go because I could not ask questions about the car and get a reliable answer. I wanted to communicate with my seller openly and be able to understand him in a very trustworthy way. Now next up is what the seller did with the van beforehand. I've already touched on this. If you buy a van from DHL or any postal service, it's probably going to be completely screwed up. If you buy a van from a construction company that used it on a construction site, it's going to be totaled. If you buy a van with like 200,000 kilometers that was used for non-long distance trips, it's probably also pretty much totaled. I quickly want to talk about the uh, kilometers and mile situation because I think that's also often overlooked. In general, yes, you can say lower mileage is always better, but I think what does that actually mean, especially because these are work vans, which means they're meant to be used. Like I said, I know nothing about repairing cars, but I did a bunch of research, asked around a lot, and I came to this following conclusion. Do not buy a car that was used for non-long distance trips. So that is cars where you start the engine, go like 10 kilometers, stop it, every day on a repetitive basis. Buying a car with over 200 kilometers is fine considering it was serviced properly and mostly used for long distance trips. Buying a car with 200,000 miles will mean when you're trying to sell your van, it will have like 250,000 miles, which means it's going to be harder to sell and worthless. So these are the four steps to buying a van. It really comes down to narrowing down what you're looking for and then just hitting up every one you find until you feel like it's the right one. I think once you find the one that's the right one, you really do feel it because I contacted so many people where I was like kind of unsure and then I didn't follow through. And when I got the van that I have now, I was like 100% committed. And when I saw it, I was like, yep, yeah, this is the one. We will now talk about the questions you have asked Lance Max. All right, audience questions. I asked on Instagram. You can go follow me there at Lance underscore Maximum. I will probably do this regularly now that I'm starting a podcast. So if you have any questions about converting a van, you can either just send me a DM or when I have it in my story, ask me a question. 
This episode, we have two questions, one from Masha and one from Manuel, but I want to answer them in one because both were about costs, specifically running costs, insurances, taxes, and registrations. Now, these are actually great questions that I also had in the beginning. Just a quick disclaimer, I've not actually registered my car, so technically I don't know exactly what the prices will be, but I've already gotten quotes for everything for this, so I feel like I can talk about it. Now, Masha's question was directed more towards, in general, how much money do you need? And like I said, this is very individual, and I believe you can do it if you want to with pretty much any budget, but I want to give you an example that's like a low-budget version that I think could work. So let's say you want to do van life full time for a year and have at least half a year where you can live kind of freely without having to worry about money too much. For the van, I would personally go for an old fire truck. You can find those currently at least for around 5 to 8k. So you would get something that has like 35,000 kilometers and is a nice old timer, hopefully runs well and is relatively spacious. For the interior, you should have at least 3K. Now I'm basing this price off of my tattoo artist because he did it for 3K and he lived in it full time. So it's definitely possible. I personally do not quite understand how people are doing this for 3K. It's definitely possible, but the things I need in my van or I want maybe is more of what I should say, just cost more. So I I could not do it for 3K, but there's definitely people that are doing it for 3K. So currently we're at around 8 to 10k for the van plus conversion. Now it's obviously hard to tell you how much you need to live in a van, but I can give you an estimate. So I'm planning with 700 a month, and if you do it as low budget as possible, you could probably get away with 500 a month for living in a van, depending on how much you drive around, etc. So let's say, for example, you need 700, you could multiply that by the months you want to be independent. So I feel like another 5k would be a great starting point. So you don't have to worry too much about making money while you're living in a van and can have somewhat of a comfortable introduction to your van experience. All in all, that brings you to a total of around 13 to 15,000 euros, I would say. And I feel like that's a realistic way of seeing it. Now, if you need to be cheaper than that, you can obviously find ways to get around that or maybe you have a job that will sustain you during your van experience so you can shave off like 5k. So I hope that gives you kind of an idea what we're looking at. And like I said, if you really want to do van life, money should not be in the way. It might just take you some time to save up money, but I feel like it shouldn't be an excuse not to do it. I saved up for at least like two years to do this. Now, the second question is from Manuel, and he was asking about running costs, insurances, and taxes. And again, this is going to vary a lot by the car you have. Like I said, old timers are a bit cheaper in these aspects. But I can tell you what I'm going to pay for my car approximately. So running costs, I can't really tell you because I've not been in it. And it's going to depend on what breaks and what doesn't. So I'm just going to skip that right now because I can't give you any valuable input. Now, insurances was a big deal to me because I really wanted to be able to drive this thing right now, but I decided to wait because here it gets complicated. My car on paper right now is a truck. In Germany, we call it LKW, which means the following, a full insurance covering everything. So even if the car gets totaled, they replace my car will cost me 200 euros per month for this car. Now, keep in mind, I'm 18. I've never had a car on my name, and I'm a complete starter without any experience in driving a car. But in Germany, and this is a big deal, if you follow certain aspects of converting the car, so I think you have to have storage space, have to have a sleeping situation, have to have a built-in cooking situation, and a few other factors that you can look up, you can actually get your van, that's a work van, registered as a camper van, and that will make things a lot cheaper. So... I asked, apparently I would, instead of paying 200 a month, pay 100 a month for full coverage. And I'm actually surprised because that's actually a very good deal. Also, quick side note, these prices are based in Munich, so it's probably a bit cheaper in other places in Germany. And again, you can get away here even cheaper. I wanted to get the full coverage because I feel like the chances of me totaling this car are actually not that slim since I'm a completely beginner driver and I'm driving this huge thing. So if you want it to be a little bit cheaper, you could get less of a coverage. And then I think you're probably looking at, for me, that would be like 60 euros a month, which is great. I think that's completely fair. 
Taxes also vary a lot on the car, obviously, but I'm looking at around 200 to 300 euros a year for that. Okay, so bonus to this episode will be my story of how I bought my van. And like I said, it took me two years to like find the van that I wanted. But also, I must say, once you're once you're actually committed to buying a car, it goes way quicker because I was always looking and like, yeah, I'm not really committed yet. So once you're set, once you set your mind to buying a van, you're buying that thing. And it's going to happen within like a month or two. I was pretty set in stone on the Mercedes Sprinter. I was very sure that I wanted a Mercedes Sprinter from at least 2013. Now, I'm not going to lie, part of that is because it looks pretty cool from the front and whatnot, but it's also a great car in my opinion. So I found this van, it had 110 thousand kilometers it looked great on the pictures and everything seemed fine it was from 2014 and cost i think it was in for 14.5 thousand euros which was technically over my budget i had originally 8k and then i said okay i might go up to 13.5 max if it's really worth it now keep in mind 2014 110 thousand kilometers for 14,000 is actually a good deal at least at the time where I was looking. That's why I said, okay, I'm gonna look at the van. I'm willing to like sacrifice a bit of my wallet to get a van that will hopefully be more reliable and easier to sell in the end. Now, when I first contacted the seller, it was a bit of a weird situation because it was like some guy who owned a repair shop and then he sent me to like his brother and whatever, I was confused. But when I had the contact and the right contact, it was great because I could communicate with him on German. He understood everything and was very friendly. I asked him a bunch of questions before I even looked at the van. So for example, what was the van used for? Why is he selling the van? Is there anything I have to know about the van before looking at it? So then the day came where we looked at the van and the first thing I did was ask the seller if we can meet at a repair shop by TÜV, which is the official organization for like registering cars in Germany, because they have what's called a Gebrauchtwagen check where professionals that are independent will check the car for you and tell you if it's complete garbage or not. So we drive out to Niedernhausen, which is a beautiful like small town. We're on this parking lot and I go into there and they actually don't even offer the service that I was there for for some reason, but they still did it. It was just kind of awkward because they did it for free, but then the seller gave them money whatever. I didn't have to pay for it and it was kind of checked quickly by professionals so I knew it wasn't completely garbage and everything important was working like the brakes were good and the engine and all the lights and blinkers were good. The seller was pretty nice. The thing was he didn't tell me about quite a few things so the radio screen was broken which is technically a small thing but it's super annoying. The wheels were actually pretty good but I didn't like them so I said the wheels were bad and that in the end also gave me a price reduction. And there were like a bunch of small things, for example the button for opening and closing the window was missing and the tow hitch and small things like that. Overall the van was still in great condition therefore I was pretty set on buying it. I just used those small minor things as a great excuse to bring the price down. What's also great about buying from a private person is that you have a lot of room in negotiating. I also asked about the history of the van and he personally was going to use it to transport his motorcycle all across Germany to then ride a motorcycle, which is kind of a weird thing, but that's what he used it for and he bought it from a French company because it's actually a French car and that French company used it for logistical services, which were long distance, which is in my opinion, very good because then you know the car was used for long distance trips and not turned off and on all the time. Now what's great about buying a car from an individual person is that you have a lot of room in negotiating. So like I said, there was a lot of small minor things. Plus because he knew a workshop very well and had a workshop, he said, okay, the wheels aren't great so we can put on new ones for you. And that was awesome because I just had to pay for the wheels and, and then they put them on the van for free, which was great. And the radio screen was broken, so he gave me like a nice big screen radio, which in the end I sold for like 200 euros, just because I needed money instead of a working radio in my car. But um, yeah, so I had a lot of negotiation and I ended up at a price of 13.5k for the van with new wheels and everything. So that's great. What I almost forgot was also that he let me test drive it without a license, which was super nice and very trustworthy of him. 
we actually went out to this like small street where nobody was and he was like yeah i got in the driver's seat you've had like a couple of lessons in driving a car so you're gonna be fine and he actually showed me how to drive the car which was super nice and i got a feel for how a van drives i've never even driven a van before so i was like i don't even know if this is good or bad or now after we signed the contract of selling the car and i had a key in my hand and it was basically no longer his car he actually got very emotional and even started crying because he was so attached to the car and that just showed me that he actually didn't want to sell the car it was just because of a bunch of personal family stuff which he then told me about and that was for one a crazy experience because you like i was super happy because i just bought like this great van and he was like crying and like super sad and emotional because it was so important to him And that also showed me that the van was definitely not like he was not just trying to sell it for a profit or whatever. So I feel like I made a good decision with that buying the van. He was even nice enough to drive it out to my place because I didn't have a license and couldn't get it. So he had the right license plates and everything to drive it out. And he also offered me that when I get my license, he's going to come over and we're going to drive around and he's going to show me how the car works. Super nice guy. I love it. And actually buying a van is so weird because we had to do the transaction with like real money and for anyone that knows me i i literally use my phone for paying everywhere like i I never have real money on me and i had to go to the bank now keep in mind i look kind of crazy i have like weird hair weird style i walk into the bank i'm like yeah i need 14,000 euros in cash they're like yeah okay that's fine (laughs) so I get the money and it's like, I'm like on my bike with like 14 grand in my bag, feeling like one of those rappers that's about to flex like stacks of money. (laughs) And so I come home and I was just scared as hell because I've never had like that much, I've never even bought anything for that much money. So it was a super crazy experience, but I think it opens your mind in a new way to like spending (laughs) in a way. So yeah, I, I can recommend it. And it's also crazy to see how much, Actually, it was more of how little 14K actually is in 200 bills. Because I was expecting like a suitcase full of money, but it was just like a a small stack. So now you know. (laughs) Yeah, so when everything was signed, I got all the papers. He got his money. I recorded everything so it's like documented. And ever since, the van has been in my driveway. And I've been starting renovations. And hopefully it's going to be on the road soon with me living in it. So that was the first episode of How to Convert a Van. I'd love it if you share this content with anyone who might be interested. You can follow the podcast. If you're on Apple Podcasts, give me a review that really would help and make me happy. So if you want to make me happy, do that. And uh, next time, I don't even know what we're going to talk about, actually. So let's just leave that open and I'll see you in the next episode. You can watch my van content on YouTube or IGTV on Instagram. Follow me there for updates and questions. And I'm just going to plug my music on the podcast because you can go on Spotify. Lance Max, I make music. Great. (laughs) See you. Bye. This was the How to Convert a Van podcast. If you would like to have more information, including video content, Follow Lance Max on social media.